fact, we know that the benefits of DNI in the workplace is well documented. Still, companies are finding it difficult. What's holding them back? There's any number of things that are preventing uh, companies achieving the kind of diversity balance they're looking for. Um, and it can be specific to you know, individual companies. I think what we need to do is to look at the start point. If, if, a, if an organization is trying to establish diversity throughout its organization, and typically it's at the top levels where you see that lack of diversity, then the start point for everybody is data. Um, Quite often, you can just look around an organization. You can see that things don't look right. It might be that the workforce is, you know, 50-50 male and female, but at the leadership levels, you're seeing far you know, fewer women coming through. So you can sense and see that things aren't right. But until you actually gather the data, then you might be aware of a problem, but it doesn't tell you exactly where the problem is, at what level, in which functions or departments or geographies you might might have a problem. So when we're talking to organizations around this kind of road that you go on or journey that you go on to establish true uh, diversity and equality at work, then our recommendation is you've got to start with the data to tell you where your problems uh, lie. Isn't it true as well that unconscious bias is in a big way derailing DNI efforts? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think it's one of the first things lots of organizations do. We're aware that, you know, if you ask most people, they will say, no, I'm not, I don't have any prejudices, I don't discriminate, I'm fair and equal in how I treat people. And by and large, you accept that most people are like that. They come with an honest and fair intent. But we all have, as individuals, our own biases that we are unaware of. We respond to different people in, in different ways. And one of the first things organizations do or tend to do is that they uh, roll out unconscious bias training as an awareness uh, exercise to make people reflect a little bit on, on their own biases. But I think it's pretty well documented now that simply rolling out unconscious bias training to raise awareness won't solve the issue in itself. Um, you probably need to take more practical steps to aid people in eliminating that unconscious bias because just because you're aware of it doesn't mean you can necessarily uh, automatically do something about it. So, you know, the steps that, you know, steps that we've undertaken at Hayes that we would recommend, you know, for our, our customers and organizations uh, in the recruitment process, you know, first thing is, are you always looking in the same place for where you get uh, your people? If you tend to go to the same university or advertise in the same media, then you're likely to get the same type of people coming into your organization. If you are presenting CVs to a line manager to make a decision on an interview or not, you are likely to feed that line manager's unconscious biases. So blind recruitment, you know, taking yeah. CVs out of that early decision making stage is an, another thing that you can do to uh, minimize the, the aspect of unconscious bias. And then, you know, introducing yeah, diversity. Yeah, Richard, into sure. Yeah, I just want to Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to see what, what impact the coronavirus has had when it comes to the priorities that some companies do have when it comes to gender and diversity now. Do you think that there are any lasting impacts from this crisis that could change how the workforce deployments are going to be played out or even just recruiting diverse talent? Well, I think there's quite a few things that probably will have uh, long-lasting effects, and we're probably unaware, uh, unaware of some of them. But... One of the things that I think will be really beneficial for diversity and particularly for gender equality is that, uh, you know, that COVID-19 has taught us that we can all work or most people can work remotely and work flexibly. So the world will move to a more hybrid working kind of model whereby we're adept at working both at home and in the office. And organizations that might have been reluctant previously to embrace home working uh, and remote working now kind of maybe have some comfort around that. So we are likely to see far more flexibility in the workplace. And, you know, that has been one of the obstacles to gender equality, particularly at more senior levels, um, as that work-life balance equation uh, gets more difficult to achieve, particularly at the onset of families, et cetera. So that's definitely one thing that will have a, yeah. a, a really positive impact, I think, on working patterns in the future. 
And tell us a bit more about just the, the obstacles that women in senior positions hold today. Do you think that the region is still culturally different from what senior women in the U.S. or, or other Western countries face? Uh, I'm afraid so, yes. Uh, I think if you just look at the data, you'll see that, um, you know, the proportion of women in more senior positions is not particularly great anywhere in the world. Um, but Asia tends, it's a, a bit of a generalization, but it tends to lag behind representation, gender representation at senior level. So there is something uh, perhaps uh, cultural there, or maybe it's just that other geographies, other locations have been quicker to embrace measures that will aid uh, gender balance. If you look at some of the advanced uh, or, or countries in, in Europe that have um, not solved the issue, but have gone long, a long way to addressing the issue, um, they have more, uh, maybe more embraced flexible working, um, but it's interesting, when you look at flexible working and benefits, uh, particularly around parenthood, one of the things that uh, uh, countries have done is if you focus on um, the father in a relationship as well as the mother, you look at both and, and try and level the playing field um, and linking social benefits around childcare to paternity leave to encourage um, the uh, father in a relationship to take more of the sort of burden of the home care and balance things out has been proven to have quite a impactful, um, make an impactful change on the way women can then progress their careers. So I think it's important that, particularly if we're looking at senior levels and particularly if we're looking at the impact of parenthood on and, and the start of a family on career progression, we make sure that we're looking at you know both genders in that equation. And to that end, Richard, I mean, something interesting out of your survey, uh, it found that 70 percent of those you surveyed in China say their leadership is diverse. That's higher than the average in Asia, which is 57 percent. Is that a surprise? What is China doing that the rest of Asia isn't? Um, well, I think, you know, if I look at our own China business, you know, we have probably the um, highest female to male uh, gender ratio there. So we're attracting more women into our organization and women are progressing through our organization. Um, and we have, you know, pretty much equal representation in, in higher ranks. So certainly, you know, China seems culturally to be more attuned to women succeeding through those leadership ranks than say some other places in, in Asia. Um, so I think there'll be a kind of cultural element to things. I don't think there is anything, you know, necessarily from, I think it largely is, you know, cultural and probably organizations recognizing that with the massive demand that there's been in China for human resources, that having a, you know, playing field where really it's only half of the employee population that's progressing through into leadership, it's a massive constraint on an organization's prospects. So there's a business reality around needing to realize the potential of all your employees yeah. that I think China, China seems to have figured out uh, quicker and faster uh, than other places as much through economic necessity as, as kind of cultural issues.